Welcome. In this final presentation, we will be exploring the cultural beliefs and perceptions of two combatant nations in order to attain a greater understanding of how those beliefs and perceptions influence the conflict between them. The conflict in question is the first Anglo-Afghan War, also known to the British as the Disaster in Afghanistan. As the British name implies, this three-year conflict culminated in an embarrassing loss for Britain, which at the time was at the height of its global empire. Part of the cause and conduct of the war can be attributed to cultural misunderstandings and false assumptions between the two, especially on the part of the British, who had blundered badly in not only their reading of the situation in Afghanistan, but also in their leadership appointments and battlefield strategies. The war between the two was largely born out of what was known as the Great Game. This was a political and diplomatic confrontation between the British Empire and the Russian Empire over influence and territories in Central and Southern Asia. The British feared the Russian encroachment in the area might lead to an invasion of India, the jewel in the crown of their empire. The Russians, on the other hand, feared British commercial and military expansion by the East India Company in the area as they attempted to extend trade routes from Moscow to India. Whether Russia had any actual intention to ever invade India is debatable, and indeed they would not step foot into Afghanistan until 1979, almost a century and a half later. In order to accomplish their respective objectives, both the British and Russians attempted to curry favor with the Emir of Afghanistan, Dost Mohammed Khan. Dost Mohammed, an ethnic Pashtun, had come to power in 1826 after deposing his predecessor Shah Shuja Durrani, who had then gone into exile. Both Russia and Britain sent agents to persuade Dost Mohammed to enter into an alliance with their side. The Russians sent the Cossack officer Count Jan Prosper Vitkovich and the British employed the young and popular diplomat Alexander Burns. Burns had made the trip to Kabul several times and had a positive impression of Dost Muhammad and his hospitality. For his part, Dost Muhammad, a competent and well-regarded leader, leaned towards allying himself with the British, hoping that they would support his move to retake important territory in Peshawar to the east of Kabul. However, with the arrival of the Russian Vitkovich, British paranoia grew and they increasingly believed that Dost Mohammed would side with the Russians, despite Burns' assurances to the contrary. 1,500 miles away in Calcutta, Burns' direct superior, the Governor General of India, Lord Auckland, made the fateful decision to ignore Burns' recommendation of allying with the pro-British Dost Mohammed, and instead overthrow him and reinstall the previous Emir, Shah Shuja. Here we see an important cultural difference in the appointment of leadership. Dost Muhammad maintained his position by way of competence and military prowess. His rule was constantly being tested on multiple fronts, and in order to field troops to support that rule, had to be charismatic enough to ensure the loyalty of the various tribal chieftains, who would in turn contribute fighting men when the emir called upon them. Lord Auckland, on the other hand, was a political appointee. While he was well educated, he had little to no knowledge of India's history and culture and little interest in the Indian people themselves, making him a poor choice for Governor General of the country. He relied heavily upon the advice of his secretary William McNaughton, a career bureaucrat who had never actually visited Afghanistan itself and had a personal dislike of the more popular and competent Alexander Burns. McNaughton was the one who urged Lord Auckland to ignore the entreaty of Burns and an alliance with Dost Mohammed in favor of returning Shah Shuja to power. This difference in cultural leadership attainment, where political connections supersede competence, is key to how the war began and played out. McNaughton showed his complete lack of knowledge about Afghanistan by insisting to Lord Auckland that the Afghans would eagerly welcome back Shah Shuja as their leader in place of Dost Muhammad. This was the opposite of the truth, as Shah Shuja was seen as an interloper and British puppet who had a penchant for excessive cruelty. A writer who witnessed a Shah at the outset of the war described him as, quote, elderly, stout, pompous, and unheroic. McNaughton also contended that Shah Shuja would be able to conduct most of the fighting with little help from the British, and again he was wrong, as Shah Shuja could only call upon around 6,000 troops, mostly exiled Afghans, and the British would have to supply most of the fighting men. The British denounced Dost Muhammad, much to Alexander Burns' dismay and assembled an army around 40,000 strong. 
Most of this army of the Indus was composed of British Indian soldiers raised in Bengal and Bombay. Alongside them were Sikh troops, East India Company mercenaries, a few Imperial regiments, and Shah Shuja's small force. With the army came William McNaughton, assigned as a political officer. The Afghans, on the other hand, had no national army on which to call, as they existed in a feudal society similar to medieval Europe. Dost Muhammad had to call upon the disparate chieftains to contribute fighting men. Unlike the British, these men had no formal military training, but years of experience fighting against other Afghans. Afghanistan was a seething cauldron of different ethnicities, which further broke down into tribes and then clans. This is reflected by a passage in K.J. Baker's book on the topic, quote, There is a series of sayings, repeated in slightly different forms and different contexts, but it can be well applied to Afghanistan. I support my country against all other countries. I support my tribe against all other tribes. I support my clan against other clans within my tribe. I support my family against all other families. I will work for my own interests against my brothers." Unquote. When not in service to the emir, they would constantly raid and fight amongst themselves, making them formidable warriors. Though the army set out in December of 1938, it took them months to even reach the southern border of Afghanistan. This was due not only to the roundabout route that had to be taken, but perhaps more so because of the way that the British traveled. Here we see a massive difference in which the two combatants prosecuted the war. While the hardy Afghan warriors would travel light, able to cover large amounts of territory at speed with a limited baggage, the British did the opposite. Accompanying the army of the Indus was an almost equal number of camp followers. These were the servants of many of the officers, along with the army support workers. This required a massive baggage train of supplies, as the British army expected to travel in comfort and style. One British general employed 260 camels just to carry his personal possessions. An officer might bring dozens of servants with him. One British regiment brought along their foxhounds. Another required two camels just to carry their supply of cigars. Shah Shuja, used to a lavish lifestyle, contributed to this sprawling mass of wagons and tagalongs by bringing with him several hundred women of his harem. Given the rough countryside of Afghanistan and a lack of proper roads, this slowed the invasion to a veritable crawl, and there was just as many losses due to accidents and illness as battle. After entering Afghanistan, the plotting army eventually captured the provincial city of Kandahar without a fight. After waiting a short period for the local crops to ripen and resupply the army, they then moved on to the important fortified trade city of Ghazni. After managing to take the city through use of their engineers in a surprise attack, Shah Shuja had many of the prisoners beheaded, much to the horror of the British forces who typically did not execute captured enemies. A small garrison was left behind in Ghazni, and the army moved on to Kabul in the north. Dost Muhammad fled Kabul and attempted to wage a guerrilla war against the British in which he was defeated every time before eventually surrendering. Upon reaching Kabul, Shah Shuja was reinstalled as emir, and it is said that he, quote, capered like a child when he took possession once again of the fortress and palace of the Bala Hisar that dominated the city, unquote. Once back in power, Shah Shuja spent much of his time tormenting those he considered to have betrayed him. The British withdrew most of their army back to India, leaving a much smaller garrison force of about 5,000 troops at Kabul. As they had extensive advantages in weapons technology, open plains battle tactics, and military training, the British saw no reason to expend the cost of maintaining any greater force, considering the Afghans mollified. However, the British made a severe tactical error in where they billeted that garrison. Instead of occupying the nearby Bala Hisar or any of the other ancient stone fortresses that would have been easily defensible, the British constructed a sprawling barracks town on the outskirts of Kabul on an open plain. The location was the worst option militarily as the ground was marshy, the camp was overlooked by easily occupied high ground, and the perimeter was close to two miles long, nearly impossible to defend with the numbers available. Even more foolishly, the camp's food supply was stored in buildings completely outside of the camp. All of this was once again done in the name of comfort for the British. The open plain was chosen for its scenic location and increased room for various activities such as horse racing and playing cricket. 
The British thought the Afghans would no longer present a threat and set about making the place a more pleasant environment. This sort of arrogant complacency was not uncommon in British society. This attitude might be explained by the rapidity of the growth of the British Empire along with its sheer size. As part of the empire that the sun never sets on, it might have been a natural tendency to believe in one's own superiority as almost divinely inspired. Unfortunately for the British, that attitude would have dire effects. For a short period, there was general calm. The British bribed the local chiefs to keep them in line, and as a cost-cutting measure, Shah Shuja's forces were trained in British tactics and supplied with their weapons instead of keeping a larger garrison force in the country. Many officers were allowed to bring their wives and families to Kabul, and they began to settle in. This had the optical effect to many Afghans of looking like an occupation by foreign forces. The British severely underestimated the independent nature of the Afghan people and the level of animosity that would come with the permanent settlement of a foreign army. The British also underestimated, or perhaps completely ignored, the amount that the puritanical Afghans would chafe at seeing their licentious lifestyles. The British went about life as they had become accustomed to, with constant socializing, dancing, and drinking. McNaughton purchased a mansion within Kabul itself, where he brought his wife in expensive tastes, complete with selections of fine wine and hundreds of Indian servants. This grated against the Afghans, who only had a single uniting factor, that of their Islamic faith. One aspect of Afghan society that seems to have been completely missed by the British is the moral code that most Afghans live by. Among the largest ethnicity, Pashtun. This was called Pashtun Wali, the way of the Pashtuns. One of the key components of this code is that to be considered a man, he had to avenge any insult with violence, regardless if the insult was real or imagined. As the British infidels knowingly or unknowingly committed infraction after infraction, the resentment of the Afghans began to bubble. Perhaps the greatest insult and factor that led to the resumption of hostilities was the interactions between the British men and the local Afghan women. There was an open scandal of Afghan women sleeping with the British occupiers, which came as a mortal insult to the manhood of the Afghan men. In a country where honor killings of women who were even suspected of premarital sex, the flagrant promiscuity between the British and their women was beyond humiliating. Apparently one of the worst offenders was Alexander Burns, who even though understood the culture, apparently indulged himself at length with the local females and gained a reputation for it. The situation began to worsen for the British. One of Dost Muhammad's sons, Akbar Khan, started to agitate for an uprising against Shah Shuja and the British. Despite reports being sent to McNaughton apprising him of the increasing tension in the country and the imminent rebellion, McNaughton displayed that same British arrogant complacency that had led to their current condition and dismissed these warnings as unfounded, asserting that prospects in the country were good and speaking condescendingly of the Afghans. Quote, These people are perfect children, and they should be treated as such. Unquote. This sort of patronizing paternalism was a typical attitude in the territories that the British colonized. Into this situation, a new British general was assigned to lead the forces in Kabul. This was Major General William George Keith Elphinstone. Elphinstone was chiefly known for his participation at the Battle of Waterloo almost 30 years earlier and had since done little in the way of field service. However, he was politically connected and well-liked. Unfortunately for the British troops at Kabul, he was also elderly, crippled by gout to the point that he had trouble moving, incontinent, lacked confidence, was indecisive, tended to dither, and had few positive qualities outside of an affable personality. At one point, during the growing crisis at Kabul, he accidentally shot himself in the buttocks while getting dressed. The situation neared a breaking point for the Afghans because of a simple political decision made thousands of miles away in London. A new Tory government came to power and directed widespread cost-cutting measures. McNaughton attempted to oblige and perhaps ingratiate himself to his superiors by cutting the bribes that were being paid to the local chieftains. As this payment was one of the only things keeping those chieftains somewhat suppressed, having it slash prompted the chieftains and many of their retainers to join Akbar Khan in his rebellion. Unlike the doddering and inept but well-connected Elphinstone, Akbar Khan resembled his father as a leader, energetic and charismatic, and he quickly gained supporters. In November of 1841, the crisis in Kabul finally came to a head. 
an incident involving an Afghan girl brought an angry mob to the home of Alexander Burns. Burns attempted to de-escalate the confrontation, but was attacked and killed alongside several British soldiers and civilians. Even though the clash could be heard back at the main camp, Elphinstone dithered over what to do, and instead of sending aid to Burns and quelling the growing uprising, he did nothing. This had the effect of emboldening the Afghans, whose numbers quickly swelled due to the lack of visible resistance. The Afghans eventually surrounded the British camp, capturing their enormous food supply that had been placed outside of the perimeter, leaving the British with just a few days' worth of food. They occupied the hills around the camp and began to snipe at the British. The British attempted to drive them off, but it ended in failure. Now starving and surrounded, the British tried to negotiate with Akbar Khan. McNaughton, overestimating Akbar Khan's greed, and not understanding the cultural implications of what he was doing, attempted to convince Akbar Khan to let the British army leave through the Khyber Pass to Jalalabad and back to India with provisions and an escort provided by Khan. In exchange, Dost Muhammad would be released. McNaughton also tried to broker secret deals with Khan to portray some of the other warlords. This made its way to Khan, who was already distrustful of McNaughton. The slack of honorable action by McNaughton prompted Akbar Khan to have him killed and his body paraded through the city. Once again, the British did nothing to avenge their people. Instead, they undertook the deal that Khan had offered to allow them to leave. In the middle of winter, the British force of around 4,500 remaining troops and around 12,000 camp followers trudged out from the camp in Kabul and made their way to the Khyber Pass, with the safety of Jalalabad 90 miles away. The retreat was poorly executed, and the column only made a few miles of progress per day. This was exacerbated by Lord Elphinstone, who would inexplicably call early halts and waffle over whether to return to Kabul. The escort promised by Khan never materialized, and the British were under constant attack by the Afghans, forcing them to abandon arms and supplies as they struggled through the narrow pass. Any stragglers caught were killed, regardless if they were women or children, something that was abhorrent to the English. The beleaguered train lost thousands to the frigid cold and lack of supplies. Akbar Khan arrived and offered to let them continue through the pass if they only halted and let him have a few hostages. Elphinstone naively accepted this offer at face value and settled down to wait. This is most likely due to the traditional gentlemanly way of conducting war that held opposing leaders to their word. When a general of an enemy army guarantees you safe passage, it was accepted that you would be allowed to leave safely. Elphinstone did not understand that Afghans did not adhere to the same principles as other European militaries and felt no need to honor any guarantees to those they saw as infidel invaders who had gravely insulted them. The result was that the delay allowed Akbar Khan to bring masses of Afghan fighters ahead of the British column to ambush them as they attempted to pass. Khan then made an offer to take the British women and children back to Kabul as hostages that would not be harmed. Again, Elphinstone agreed, and the women and children, or rather, the British women and children, were delivered to Khan. As the East Trading Company would not pay a ransom for the Indian women and children, their fate lay with the British troops trudging ahead. As a ragged column continued on, the number of deaths due to cold increased. Finally, Khan offered to negotiate directly with Elphinstone and invited him into his camp. Again, Elphinstone expected to be treated in the Western manner and be allowed to return to his troops at the end of the negotiations. But Khan simply claimed that Elphinstone and several of his officers were hostages, and the British were robbed of their senior leadership, no matter how poor. What remained of the British force attempted a night march, but was blocked by a thick tangle of thorny bushes that the Afghans had placed to block their way. A few managed to make it past and make a last stand on some higher ground, fighting to the last man. A handful were taken prisoner for later ransom, but only one British soldier made it through to Jalalabad to tell the tale. That was the army surgeon, Dr. William Bryden. In the aftermath of what was called the worst military disaster in British history until the fall of Singapore over a century later, most of the other British garrisons were overrun. Dost Muhammad was eventually released and reclaimed his throne, ruling for decades after. Lord Elphinstone would die in captivity. 
The British returned with the aptly named Army of Retribution in order to enact revenge and free their imprisoned citizens. Upon hearing of the Khyber Pass death trap, Lord Auckland suffered a stroke and had to be replaced. Once the prisoners were recovered, the British withdrew from Afghanistan, though they would return in several years with greater success. This campaign helps to demonstrate some of the cultural differences and misconceptions that the two belligerents brought to the conflict. The appointment of leadership by political connection as opposed to competence greatly harmed the British cause. Their inability to break with the comforts that they were accustomed to not only slowed their initial invasion, but contributed to the resentment of the more Spartan Afghans. They did not take into account the codes of honor that the Afghans lived by and the level of animosity that would come as a result of their dalliances with the local women. And finally, they attempted to negotiate with the false understanding that Akbar Khan would act in accordance with typical Western traditions and honor his guarantees, resulting in the slaughter of the British forces. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. Thank you for listening.